Welcome, everybody. This is City on a Hill Community Church. If you're in the back, come on to the front. Let's get ready to sing this morning. If you're sitting, let's stand. Let's get ready to sing. separate
It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. Sing with me. writes to Timothy. He says this, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into, came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. Paul, who wrote the majority of the New Testament, of, to, to save sinners of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God be honor and glory forever and ever. See, as, as we were singing and we were talking about breathing Jesus. 
breathing life, breathing Christ. And I read what Paul says here of sinners of whom I am the worst. God can shine through even your worst moments. Even your worst. See, we can talk about breathing Christ when we're here. We can talk about breathing Jesus when you're at church or when you're reading your Bible or when you're praying. But do you realize that you also breathe Jesus when you mess up? That you also breathe Jesus when you make mistakes? That you also breathe Jesus when you turn your back on Him? Because it's God showing patience. It's God showing grace. It's God showing mercy that goes beyond everything. We can't be perfect. We're not. You and I are not perfect. You and I make mistakes. But when we expect perfection, we don't give God the opportunity to show his patience. Now, I'm not saying to go ahead and just start sinning all you want. Don't, don't, don't twist what I'm saying. But what I am saying is this. When you do fall short, God has already paid the price for you and for me and for Paul, the worst of sinners. Everybody. He's paid the price. And because of that, Christ can shine through you in any situation. God, thank you for your love. Thank you for your example. Thank you for your pursuit of us. God, I pray for the person here who is constantly beating, them, beating themselves up for how, much, for how many mistakes they make, for how they fall short, for maybe what they did this morning. God, I pray that they know your grace is sufficient. Your sacrifice is enough. Your love provides everything that we need. Help us to understand it, Lord God. Help us to live our lives in a way that reflects it. Help us to breathe you in every situation. Help us to love. God, thank you for the opportunity to know you more, to grow closer to you, to experience more of you, to understand you better, to understand ourselves better, to know each other better, to, to have fellowship with each other and to put you first. I pray that in all we do, we glorify you. I pray that in all that I say, in every way that I act, and every example that I behave in, Lord God, help me to point back to you constantly. We love you, God. Have your way this morning. Thank you for being here, waiting for us. Thank you for being in every area of our lives. God, I pray that you take over. Take over this church. Take over our lives. Take over the, this country, this world. Help us to point back to you. We love you, Lord God. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. And everybody said... Amen. Take a moment to greet somebody around you. Find somebody you don't know. Welcome to church today. Again, welcome to City on a Hill Community Church. It's a dreary morning out there, and we're really glad that you are here with us. It's nice and cozy. If you take a big whiff, you've probably already noticed it. You can probably smell food. If you didn't, observe. <laughs> We've got a ton of food over there uh, to your left. So we're having a family lunch after church, uh, after, after church today. Um, <laughs> yes, we're having a family lunch. So 
This is for our entire family lunch. So if this is your first Sunday here, or if you've been coming here for a while, you're invited. If you left your crock pot on the counter and you're feeling kind of ashamed, that's okay. You can still stay. If you didn't bring anything, we just want everybody here. So after service, we're going to make these chairs disappear, and we're going to roll out some tables. And the only agenda for our family lunches is just to hang out and spend time together. So you're invited. Um, also, if you look to the right, although if you're, if you're in the back rows, you're the only ones who are going to see this, but you might have noticed that our Hill kids are having a bake sale this morning. They are amazing. This is, this, uh, this is the third time that they've done this, but they do fundraisers, and all of the proceeds go to our ministry with Be More Caring, which is an organization that ministers to the homeless in Baltimore. So grab lunch. Go on over. Come on cookie. Just one with me. Um, but yeah, they really appreciate it. They worked really, really hard on this, so they're really excited to uh, sell some seeds to you guys. A few other announcements. There's a men's breakfast at the Golden Corral by Arundel Mills. It's on the 17th, which is this coming Saturday. Um, if you want more information about that, it's in your bulletin, but Pastor Shane will be there for sure, and hopefully some other men. <laughs> It's Golden Corral, so I mean, I think he's going to be a happy guy no matter what. But yeah, if you'd like more information about that and you are a man and you'd like to be there, check out your bulletin. Um, we also have our annual church meeting next Sunday. It's the 18th. So what an annual church meeting is, again, it's annual, so it's every year, and it's just a time for us to come together. And Shane will let you know. We'll share with the congregation about what's, what's the status quo sitting on a hill. What have we done well this year? What are we working on? I mean, it's also a chance for all of you to pick his brains and ask any question that you want. That thing that's just been burning inside of you, your moment is here. It's next Sunday. So you're invited to that. And again, there's more information. Child care will be provided for that. And also, we will be nominating our new board for the coming year. Um, if you are a woman and you signed up for the paint night at the end of the month, you should have received an email this week uh, with information about that. So please check your email. And if you signed up and you didn't get one, Sandy, if you could just raise your hand. She's our Shine Women's uh, Ministry Director, and she's the one that can give you more information about that. So if our ushers could come forward. Um, I also wanted to let you guys know that on the back table, our treasurer, Ben Ross, this really awesome guy that I happen to be married to, <laughs> he has your giving statement. So if you've been tithing over the past year, um, if you either had in an envelope that was labeled or you've been doing it online, then Ben put together a giving statement for you to use for tax purposes. So it's in a box on the welcome table. It's alphabetized, and you can pull that out. So we could bow our heads, and we'll pray over our tithes and offering. Heavenly Father, we just we thank you for your love. Um, we come together in unity this morning. We come with thankfulness in our hearts. We give these tithes and offerings as a means of showing that we see what you give us, God. We're thankful for what you've given us. And also as a show of faith, God, that we believe that you will give us whatever we need. Thank you for your love. Please be with Pastor Shane as he delivers your word this morning and be with us at our lunch, that our thoughts, our words, and our actions would bring you honor and glory. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
Well, welcome to church today. We're so glad that you're here. I don't know if I said this last week or not, but um, that, that bumper video, well, Lene always puts together all of our bumper videos, but she actually filmed that one too, and she did a really good job. Those hands are Gabriel's hands. He could be a, he could be a hand model. So yeah, give, give Lene a hand for that. She did a good job. So you'll have to forgive me this morning. Um, uh, uh, I've talked to maybe already, but I am actually sick. I actually just threw up like maybe 45 minutes ago, so I'm going to try to get through this as best as I can. So I am also not going to be sticking around for the family lunch afterwards, in case you're wondering, like, why isn't the lead pastor here? I'm going to preach and leave. So just in case you were wondering um, where I disappeared to. So bear with me this morning if you can. But we're in the second week of our series called All the Feels, and last week we started by talking about anger. The whole point of this series is to talk about our different emotions the different ways that we feel and and how we handle them. For some people, they can be good at handling emotions. For other people, not so much. Um, And uh, there are different emotions that we all handle differently. And maybe you're like, okay, I'm better with handling this one emotion, but I'm not as good at handling this one emotion. And so we're trying to talk about all of them and and how they can can impact us, how, how we can interact with the emotion. Is it healthy? Is it not healthy? All of these sort of questions. So last week, we started talking about anger. And um, uh, we we said that when we get upset, it isn't necessarily always a bad thing. But instead, there should be some things that that do make us upset. There should be some things that do make us angry. Um, And and it's what we do with that anger from that point on. And the whole question is, the whole bottom line with last week, if you didn't listen to it, you can can, uh, go on Facebook or YouTube. It's posted there. And uh, the whole point with last week was, is your anger from you or is it from God? If it's from you, then it's probably not a good thing. But if it's from God, if you share your anger with God over something, then do something about it. Then we can, we, can, we can try to figure out how to handle it from that point on. But anger can be a difficult thing to handle. So we talked about that a little bit last week. And today, I figure that, that we need to talk about one specific emotion given what is happening this week. What, what, what happens this week, men? What did you say? Say it again. Valentine's Day. Good job. I thought I heard somebody say the Olympics, which is true. Which <laughs> is true. Um, but Valentine's Day is happening this week. So what are we going to talk about today? Love. Everybody loves love, right? Um, so we're going to talk about uh, a love. And if you didn't know that Valentine's Day is this week, Valentine's Day is this week, guys. Okay, so make sure that you take care of it. But last week, we talked about an emotion that, in anger that doesn't really threaten a man's masculinity. You know, anger is not really something where, like, if you feel anger, you don't feel, like, weird about it. Sometimes, for men, and there are some women as well, when it comes to love, it's like, okay, uh, this is, I don't really know about that. I don't really want to get, I don't really want to get in touch with my feelings, with my emotions. I don't really want to talk about all this lovey stuff. Valentine's Day is just a holiday that is created so that, so that it makes us go out and spend more money on each other. It's not even a real holiday. Like, these are kind of the, 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 the reactions that we can have. Obviously, a lot of the men are already <laughs> not in their heads. But... Love is something that, that we need to talk about, and we talk about quite often here at church, but, um, but if you want to talk about an emotion that makes you do crazy things, love is one of them, wouldn't you say? Love is an emotion that can make you do some weird things, that can make you, that can make you act in a way that isn't typical for you, because when you find yourself in love, then you're willing to do a lot of things for the other person, right? You're, you're willing to go above and beyond for the other person. Especially, especially when, or at least when you think that you are in love. Uh, especially when you first start in a relationship with somebody and you're feeling all these emotions and you're like, oh, this is wonderful. Now, if you've been married for like a long time, you are having a difficult time remembering what that felt like. And I get it. I get it. But try to put yourself in your, in your teenage year shoes or, or in your early 20s or 30s or whenever you started dating somebody and think about those emotions that you started to feel when you first started to be with somebody. You were willing to do stupid things, weren't you? you were, and, and you were also so nervous. You, you were willing to go above and beyond. For there are all these different things that come in, and love can make you do things that aren't exactly typical. But this is an emotion that, that can be difficult and confusing to handle for us because it changes the way that we interact. And for some people, this emotion can even be uncomfortable. Can even be a little bit like, ah, I don't really know about this. 
I'm not, I'm not good at, at showing love to other people. I'm not, I'm, this is just uncomfortable for me. I don't want to get in touch with any of this stuff. And no matter how love makes you feel, the bottom line is this. We all need it. We all need love. No matter who we are, no matter who you are, you need love. Now, some people may need more than others or maybe more attention than others, or some people like having a lot of people around them. Maybe you're like, I just need love from like these two people in my life. I just need, I, as long as these two people love me, I'm good. That, that may be you, and that's great too. But the bottom line is, we all need it. Every single person needs love in their life. And so since we all need it, we will look for it or the idea of it in so many different places. Anything, any, any place, anywhere that we go that makes us feel loved, at least temporarily, we're willing to pursue it because we need it. So growing up, I, I, was, I was sort of the person that could never be alone. If you, if for those of you, my family know me, obviously, but for those of you who knew me when I was younger, I was one of those, I was one of those people who never could be alone, and it got me into a lot of situations and relationships that, that weren't very good, <laughs> and, and whenever I was alone, I didn't know what to do or how to handle it, right? So I had this desire to experience falling in love. I had this desire to find the person who is the love of my life, and praise God I found her, and Lauren, because she's awesome, but I, there, was this, there was so much in my life where I just would date a lot of different girls because I'm not, I'm not I don't know, this is kind of weird to talk about, but I, I would do that because I was uncomfortable alone. I didn't know how to do it. I felt worthless when I wasn't with somebody. I felt like, you know what, the, the, I found my value in being with somebody else, which is not right, not accurate, or any of those sort of things. But that, that was what was going on in my stupid head that is often stupid. But eventually, when I would get to a place where, where I was single, then I'd be like, oh, I don't know how to handle this, and then I'd be sad, or I'd be, you know, whatever it is, and I, I would jump into a relationship that was terrible for me, that wasn't good, and within like a few weeks, sometimes a few days, a few months, I'd be like, this was a mistake, right? This was not good, and you've probably been there before in your life as well, where you got into a relationship, and you're like, this was not good. This was not the place that I should go. I, this, this was a mistake, and uh, I, we had this desire to do, for love, that it makes us do crazy things. Um, there's one relationship, one particular relationship that I remember that I've shared with you before if you've been here for a while. But I started dating this girl. Sorry, Lauren. I started dating this girl, and, um, and we, were, we were together for a little while, and I knew that she didn't have the same values as me. I knew that she didn't have the same morals as me. Basically, I knew that she wasn't a Christian. So I was, I was doing what we call missionary dating. You ever do that? You ever do missionary dating? When you're a Christian and you're like, okay, I really like this person, but they're not a Christian, and I want them to be a Christian, so if I date them and they like me enough, they'll end up coming to church, and then they'll be a Christian, and then it'll be like a love story, and we'll all, it'll, we'll all be happily ever after, all these sort of things, and then you find out that rarely, rarely, rarely does that ever work, like rarely <laughs> does that work. It has worked. I, I know that it has for some people, but... Don't count on it, okay? Uh, or it's even worse. This is another thing. If you're in a relationship with somebody who's not a Christian and you think, well, if we get married, if we get married, then they'll be a Christian. You are fooling yourself. Fooling yourself and you're setting yourself up for a lot more trouble and a lot more difficulty. Side note. Okay, so I was, I was dating this girl. We liked each other. I was like, man, she's really cool. We're hanging out. We're going on dates. And, and I, I kept like giving little hints and like nudging her like, hey, why don't you come to church with me this Sunday? She's like, no, no, I'm okay. That's all right. I, I don't, I don't want to go to church. And I, would, I didn't want to, like, push her. So I was like, okay, all right, that's fine. And so then I would gently nudge her again over and over and over again. And then eventually got to a point where I was like, and I was already working as a youth pastor at this point. So the, it's a big deal. So eventually got to a point where I was like, look, if you're not even going to give this a chance, then we have no chance. Like, if you're not even going to come, come to church at all, if you're not even, like some people are willing to say, I'll at least go to church and don't expect me to, to become a Christian, but I'll go with you just because I care about you. It's like, if you're not even willing to do that, then this isn't going to work. This isn't going anywhere. And she said, I, I understand, but 
What, what you need to understand is this. I'm a witch. She was, she was a witch. <laughs> I don't know if you ever dated a witch before. But I'm always worried that I'm going to be cursed or something. I don't know. So she said that she was a Wiccan, but she was like, don't worry, though. I'm a good witch. I was like, oh, like in the Wizard of Oz? Is that how that works? Like, I'm a, I'm a good witch. So, it's, so we're okay. It's like, no, we're not okay. It's like, we, I, can't, I can't be with you. And she was like, why? I was like, why? It's like, this has to end. I was, and, I, and, I, and we were sitting in Applebee's. And she told me, if you're going to tell somebody you're a witch, don't do it in Applebee's, right? So we're sitting in Applebee's. She tells me she's a witch. I'm like, ah. Oh, what? So I ended it, and she was mad. She was very, very mad at me, and, uh, and because I guess I'm so desirable. But she was very, very <laughs> mad at me. And so, <laughs> it's a joke. But she was very upset, and she was like, you weren't even honest with me. If, you, if, that, was, if, that, if that was the way that you felt, I was like, I wasn't honest. You were a witch this whole time, and I didn't know it. But the point is this. There were a lot of red flags. A lot of red flags prior to that that should have told me, hey, this is not the best relationship for you to be in. But my desire to be loved, I was willing to overlook those red flags in the hope of finding the perfect relationship. I was willing to overlook other things just because I wanted to, to find love. Because we desire love. We all do. Hopefully you feel love. Hopefully you've experienced love. Hopefully you, 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 right now in this moment, maybe if you are in a relationship or even if you're not. Because I know this, Valentine's Day and this time of year can be difficult for a lot of people. And if you aren't in a relationship, there is nothing wrong with you. As a matter of fact, you were made exactly how God has designed you to be. And you are exactly where God has called you to be. Doesn't make you any less of a person, doesn't make you any different, any of that sort of stuff. So sometimes I, I don't like talking about relationships because I don't want the person who is not in a relationship to feel excluded. I don't want the person who is not in a relationship to feel like, oh, well, this isn't for me. Because it is. It's absolutely for you. This is, this is as much for you as it is for anybody. So we all have this desire to be loved. So I want to ask yourself this. Do you, do the people that you love know that you love them? The people that you really care about, the people that, that you, they, that maybe those two, three, four, it could be up to, I don't know, ten people, those people who you really, 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 really love, are they aware of it? And if so, how? That's what I want you to ask yourself. How do you let those that you love know that you love them? Do you? Or do you just assume that they know? Do, or do you just assume that, 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 that they get it? See, obviously, you know that I'm a man, a weak man, but still a man. And so when it comes to this, when it comes to love, it's uncomfortable. And I, it's, it's something weird, right? For me, you know that I, I, obviously I'm up on stage and, I, and I'm preaching every week. And there's something easier, and this, this may just be me. But for me personally, there's something easier for me about standing up on a stage and being honest and raw with you than it is with the closest people in my life. And I don't know why that is. Because it's not the other person. It's not anybody else's fault. Sometimes it's easier to talk about what I'm feeling up here than it is in a one-on-one -on -one relationship with another person. Maybe that's because you can't respond. I don't know. I, I don't know why that's the case. But that's kind of the case. Maybe it's because as a guy, I don't want to seem vulnerable one-on-one -on -one and have to face difficult things and have to answer difficult questions. I don't know why that is. Maybe, maybe you are similar. Maybe for you it's like, okay, I don't, I don't want to sit here and have a really deep, intimate conversation with another person because it makes me uncomfortable. It makes me feel weird. It makes me have to face things that I don't want to face. And so... When it comes to this emotion of love, we like to just kind of push it off to the side. You know that I love you, right? You, you know, you get it. You, you know that I care about you, right? 
You, you know, uh, you know I, I, said, I said these vows to you 25 years ago. You know that I care about you, right? It wasn't that good enough. I got to keep telling you. I got to keep showing it to you. You, you know, you know, you're talking to your kid. You know that I love you. You know that I love you, but I, I'm only tough on you because I want what's best for you, which is very true. But do you also show them that you love them? And for the kids, do you show your parents? Like, they, we don't often think about how we show our love and being intentional about showing our love. So our goal today is to figure out how you handle and how you express love. So we're going to look at a letter that Paul wrote to the church in 1 Corinthians 13. Um, and uh, I don't know if it'll actually be on the screen or not. Nope. Okay, that's all right. If you got your Bibles with you, open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And at this point, this letter that Paul is writing, he's writing to the church in Corinth, which is a community of new believers. They're, 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 they're new believers, new Christians. This whole church is made up of brand new believers. And they were really rough around the edges, okay? This, this community, this city, uh, this, this church in Corinth, they were rough. They, they were kind of people who became Christians or became followers of Jesus but still wanted to do what they wanted to do. And so when a person becomes a Christian, it doesn't necessarily guarantee that they are then going to be nice. I don't know if you know that, but that's the situation here. Just all of a sudden saying, okay, I'm a follower of Jesus now, doesn't make you a nice person. You have to actually try to be a nice person. And so the church in Corinth was not really doing that. They were not committed to it. And they, they, they had a reputation for being unruly. They had a reputation for hard drinking. They had a reputation for sexually promiscuous groups of people in the church. Like this is, this is a really rough group of people who are wanting to be followers of Jesus. So Paul writes to them, and, he, and, he's, and he's trying to explain to them what it actually means to be a follower of Jesus, what it means to call yourself a Christian. So he's trying to influence them. Here's what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. He says, if I speak, in the, starting in verse 1, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrong. Love does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and, and we prophesy in part, but when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. So what we see here is Paul giving instructions on love. The first thing we see is this. Love is powerful. Love is powerful. Love is strong. I mean, right, it says right there in verse 2 and later in verse 8, if I have faith that can move mountains but have not love, I am nothing. Love never fails. See, I, I don't care who you are, how much money you make, what sort of status you have, what sort of skin color you have, how tall you are, how short you are, what gender you are. I don't care about any of that. If you don't love, you are nothing. You could be the greatest business person in the world. If you don't love, you're nothing. You could be the greatest athlete. You could be the greatest student, the greatest doctor, the greatest nurse, whatever, fill in the blank. I could be the greatest pastor, and if I have not love, I am nothing. See, a lot of times we get, we get, so, we get so high on ourselves. 
you think, oh, man, I've made it in life. Maybe, maybe you've got a house that you love. You've got some cool cars. You've got, you got some great things. You've got your family, all these sort of things. If you don't have love, it means nothing. It means squat. None of it matters. You can take all that stuff. I'll take love any day of the week. So it's great that, that, that you have the status that you do. It's great that you live in Howard County or Baltimore County or Anne Arundel County or wherever it is that you're from. And it's great that you're in the top 1% of the richest, wealthiest people in the world. That's all great. If you, have, if you don't have love, nothing. Nothing. None of it matters. We have to focus on how powerful it is. If I have faith that can move mountains but have not love, I am nothing. See, I, I want to speak to the parents in the room first. If you have, well, obviously if you have kids, you're a parent. And if you don't take the time to show, the, show your kids how much you love them, you discipline them, you do all these great things, and you only want what's best for them, but you don't take the time to show them how powerful love is, failing. You're nothing. I want you to take time this week to show your children how much you love them. Take time. Show them how much you care. Show them how much you would do anything for them. Even when they're annoying, even when they're bratty, even when they're spoiled, even when they're fill in the blank. They should always know that you love them. Now, love is also found in discipline. So I'm not saying to be your kid's best friend. I'm saying to be your kid's parent and show them that you love them. Now, to the kids in the room, and to those of you who your parents are still around, adults as well, take time to show your parents how much you love them. Take the time. I want you to, to, this week, figure out a way, figure out a way to show your parents how much you care, how much you love them, and how you are willing to do anything for them. Love your family. There's nothing more important than loving those closest to you and loving those that you encounter. Nothing more important. And there is, for the kids, there's nothing more important to your parents than your love. That's what they want. That's what they care about. If you go above and beyond to show your parents how much you care about them, it will make their year. I guarantee it. It will make their year. Do what it takes. Because I know that for most of the, now this isn't every situation I realize, but most of the time, Parents will do absolutely anything for their kids. They could be offered the world, and they would turn it down for you. You may not necessarily believe that, but I'm willing to bet that it's true. Now, if you don't have a good relationship with your parents, or if you don't even know your parents, sorry. That's not the way it's supposed to be. Love is powerful, and love changes lives regardless of how somebody else acts you show love every time this week i want you to be to make a specific effort to show love to your family i don't i don't care how busy you are i don't care you can tell me how much work you got going on you can tell me how many things you got planned i don't care because none of that should come before god and your family so your homework this week is to spend time with your family and love them. Spend time with those who are closest to you. Cancel plans. If the only night that you can do it is the night of your community group, you have my permission to not go to community group to hang out with your family. Be, be intentional. Because that's what Paul tells us. Love, it's intentional. It's intentional. What does it look like? He gives us a whole list. 
He gives us a whole list of exactly what love looks like. But all of those things don't happen naturally. They have to be intentional. See, love will never fail you. Love will never let you down. Love is not something to be embarrassed by, but instead love is something to be overwhelmed by. Be intentional on showing it. This is this passage. Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Did you feel like you were just at a wedding? I mean, it's right at every wedding, isn't it? But it's good. It's good. I mean, this gives us exactly what love should look like. But most of the time, I feel like people think, well, this is how other people should show love to me. Did, did you read 1 Corinthians 13? Why aren't you showing me this sort of love? See, we, we don't take it and say, I should show love this way. We take it and we say, you should show love to me that way. That's often what we do. Because it's always, well, you don't do this. Don't point the finger. Be intentional about loving. Be intentional about seeking other people out. And really, Paul is, telling, Paul, Paul is not telling us what to expect. Paul is telling us how to behave. That's what he's telling us. He lays it out, everything right there for us. This is what love should look like. And all of these things don't happen unless you make it happen. Unless you're intentional about it. So you feel this emotion. You say that you have this emotion of love. Prove it. There's nothing wrong, guys. There's nothing wrong with showing other people that you love them. Nothing. There's nothing more manly that's out there. There's nothing stronger out there than taking the time to be intentional about showing love. Nothing stronger. All these things don't just happen on their own. Because love, here's the other thing. Love is not love if it's not tested. Because love costs something. It's sacrificial. It's tough. So you say you got love. A lot of times we have love when it's convenient. Not convenient. Can't be. Love is not love. Until we put it to the test. There, see, these traits don't come naturally to me. I don't know, I don't know about you. The, everything that he lists of patience does not come naturally to me, right? Envy, you know, do not envy, it doesn't come natural. All these things that are in this category, it's like, ah, that's just something that I can do so easily without thinking. It's so it's so hard. To actually be intentional about showing love to people. But contrary to popular opinion, this passage is not about romantic love. I don't know if you know that. It's not about romantic love. See, in, in the Greek, there's four different ways to say love. And we just have one word, love. But there's four different translations of love in the Greek. The first one is, I'm going to try to pronounce them, is eros. And this is the sensual or erotic type of love. And it's never used in the New Testament. So this is like love. You know what I mean? So that's what that is. <laughs> then there's phileo. This is the brotherly type of love. That's why Philadelphia. <laughs> there you go, Anthony. That's why Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love. If No, it's not. It's just the name. Then there's, because uh, <laughs> if you saw any videos, then you know that's not true. Uh, then there's storage. This is family love. And none of these is this love that is listed that Paul is using in, in, in 1 Corinthians 13. What the word that he uses is agape. It's this all-encompassing love. Love to everybody. Love that you show to everybody that you encounter. This, is, this right here is not just for if you're in a relationship or if you're married, if you're dating somebody. This right here is how you treat every individual that you encounter your friends, your enemies, your frenemies, your boss, your 
coworker, your annoying sibling, whatever it is, whoever it is, you show this love, and you have to be intentional about it. So your homework, go home and be intentional about loving your family. Go to work and be intentional about loving your coworkers. Come to church and be intentional about loving the people right around you. Everywhere that you are, decide. Choose now. Because love is always stronger than hate. Every single time. Every single time. But it's up to you. Let's stand and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for how you have impacted us. We thank you for you, how you have influenced us. God, we pray that we can be intentional and reminded to show love all the time. Not just on Valentine's Day, not just this time of year, but every day, Lord God, help us to seek out others. Help us to not be embarrassed or ashamed of the things or the people that we love. But help us to be overwhelmed by the love that you have given us to show others. I pray that as a church, when people walk in these doors, they feel at home. They feel at home. I pray that they feel the love that you have shown them. I pray that when people come in here that they don't feel like, wow, this is a church that is all about themselves, but instead a church that is about Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is about looking out for others. God, we can only do this with your help. We need you. I pray that as we go, we look for ways to show who you are. God, bless our lunch this afternoon. Pray that you give us a great time hanging out and being a family together. Bless the food that we're about to eat and everybody who prepared it. Thank you for the hearts of people who want to see your kingdom grow. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Everybody said amen. So if you're hanging out for the family lunch, just stick around. We're going to clean up these chairs and bring some tables out. If you need to go, that's great. Bless you. We'll, we'll, we'll see you next week. And don't forget your giving statements in the back. Thanks.